Good morning. Uh, my name is Angelina. Um, First off, uh, thank you, Lou, Andy, and everyone else at the Naples Preserve. Becky, of course, uh, for having Everglades National Park and the National Park Service. Uh, join you all for the Nature Talk series once again. I'm very honored to be the first speaker of the series. Uh, Happy New Year to everyone. I hope 2022 is going fabulous for all of you. Um, so again, my name is Angelina Guerra. Uh, as Lou mentioned, uh, I am a National Park Service park ranger. Uh, I am originally from South Florida. I'm very happy to find my myself back home um, as a seasonal employee with the Park Service a few years ago. I did make my way over out west a few times. Uh, I spent a summer at Glacier National Park in Montana, another summer at Zion National Park in Utah. Uh, I became a permanent year-round employee of the National Park Service in 2017 over at Carlsbad Caverns National Park in southeastern New Mexico. Uh, but Everglades National Park is where I got my start over at the Homestead Entrance about three hours or so from Naples. Um, and uh, I'm very happy to be, again, back here in my position uh, as a park ranger out of the Gulf Coast area of Everglades National Park. So I'm stationed over in Everglades City, about a 45 minute drive to an hour drive for most areas in Naples. Um, so uh, today I have a talk prepared for you all. It's a talk I delivered uh, last year with, of course, a few changes, um, but it's a talk on astronomy, one of my personal uh, favorite subjects. Uh, I uh, certainly consider myself a stargazer, a sky watcher. Uh, I do love astronomy. Uh, I feel like it's something that unites everyone um, and something very beautiful and very interesting. And interestingly enough, my passion, my love for astronomy uh, actually was born and grew when I was serving at Carlsbad Caverns National Park in New Mexico. And I always think how ironic it was that in a park where I only saw the sky for half my time, since I was down in the cave for most of my shifts, um, in a park where I only saw the sky for about half my time is where uh, I really started uh, learning the night sky and really falling in love with it and just kind of all the concept of astronomy. So um, I have a PowerPoint presentation uh, prepared for you all. And uh, it's a general on general astronomy, um, nothing too in depth, of course, uh, kind of an introduction, if you will. Uh, we'll go over a little bit about Everglades National Park itself. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the definitions out there, uh, talk about some of the different objects in the night sky, what exactly are they? Um, and then um, I'm hoping to um, bring it bring it all home for you all in that I'm hoping to tell you a little bit about what you all could see tonight uh, if you went out uh, at your doorstep this evening and you looked up in the sky, even in Naples, uh, what would you be able to see? There's quite a bit up there. Uh, I myself live in Naples. I live in East Naples. And uh, every night when I go home, I always take a moment to look up and I can see a couple things. So we'll talk a little bit about what you all can see tonight. Uh, if you were to step outside into your yard or at your doorstep, uh, what you all uh, could see. Uh, my program, I've titled it Beauty on the Ground, Beauty in the Sky. Um, again, it's it's the, the program I prepared for the Naples Preserve uh, last season with a few changes. I did the program uh, last year. I did it in early March. So the sky looks a little different in early March than it does now in mid-January. So, of course, there's some modifications. Uh, but Beauty on the Ground, Beauty in the Sky, uh, talking a little bit about um, all the resources here in Everglades National Park, both the ones that we can see during the day and at nighttime. So for one, uh, maybe first and foremost, uh, Everglades National Park, uh, it was first set aside in 1947. Uh, this is actually our 75th uh, anniversary year. We turned 75 on December 6th. Um, and actually, if you folks are interested, there will be uh, special speakers that the National Park will be hosting um, throughout the year, uh, both in person and virtually. So if you're on social media, if you visit our park website, um, you can be up on that. We'll have different speakers from uh, different conservation groups um, in, in, in the region. So if you're interested, uh, we do have a special speaker series for our 75th anniversary. Uh, but Everglades National Park uh, was set aside on December 6, uh, 1947, and we were the first uh, national park in the United States set aside for the protection of biological resources. Here in Everglades National Park, we're made special by the things that live within the park boundaries, uh, the animals, the birds, the plants. Um, that is what makes us special. Uh, parks prior to us, like Yellowstone, Grand Canyon, uh, Rocky Mountain, Yosemite, for example, uh, they were set aside for their geological resources or perhaps for their striking scenic beauty. 
we'd be the first again uh, set aside to protect uh, the biology, the things that live, uh, animals, plants, birds, once again. Now, uh, not only are our biological resources very important here at Everglades National Park, our physical resources are important as well. I'm sure a lot of you know here in South Florida, all of our drinking water comes from areas like Everglades National Park and the Big Cypress National Preserve and other uh, protected areas that protect our watersheds. So obviously our water and our hydrology is important. Um, our habitats, our uh, ecosystems are important as well, uh, but our night sky uh, is important too. Uh, night sky is a very important physical resource. Uh, we'll talk a little bit uh, about the benefits of the night sky and why night skies are important later on in the presentation. Uh, but a lot of people like to say of all national parks uh, that half the park is after dark. Um, so uh, when you come out to visit us, do remember that there is certainly an evening time, a night time to the park, just as spectacular as the daytime. Uh, this picture right here that you're seeing uh, was actually taken uh, at an offshore key here in the Gulf Coast area. This was taken at Jewel Key, which is five miles away from uh, the visitor center here in Everglades City. Um, and you can look up above and you can see the very beautiful starry night sky, uh, mostly, uh, mostly free of light pollution. And so this was taken at Jewel Key here in Gulf Coast. Uh, and again, just kind of showing that uh, our physical resources are also as important as our biological ones, uh, our water, hydrology, uh, certainly our night skies. Um, so we'll dive into some of the definitions here. Uh, kind of, you know, there's different terms, of course, in astronomy, astronomy like there are different terms in uh, every science and pretty much every, every subject and topic. So we'll go a little over a few definitions because this tends to sometimes confuse folks is what I've found when we do our astronomy programs here on site. A lot of folks will have questions on, you know, what exactly is a constellation? What exactly is this? So we'll start off with, with some general definitions, if you will. So first off, very, very popular term in, con in, in astronomy, uh, a constellation. What exactly is a constellation? Um, so a constellation is basically a group of stars uh, that make up an imaginary shape in the night sky. Uh, really important to know there's nothing scientific uh, really about a constellation. Uh, it's just a pattern in the night sky. Um, a lot of constellations are very, very old. So they go back to ancient civilizations, the Greeks, the Romans, the Egyptians, uh, etc. So a lot of constellations that we still have uh, that we still have named today were named many, 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 many years ago by much earlier people. Uh, a good example of an old constellation, if you will, is the one that's pictured right here on the slide. This is a constellation Leo. Uh, so if you look here in the picture, uh, with some imagination, you might be able to see the head of a lion, maybe the whole body of the lion, then over to the tail. So uh, Leo is the lion uh, over to the right-hand side of the screen there. Uh, by where you have Algeba and Regulus, uh, that kind of little curvature would be the head of the lion. Uh, and then that long line there by where you see M105 and M96 would be the body of the lion. And then finally, you kind of have like a triangle there uh, in the back, that would be the tail. So Leo the lion uh, is a constellation. Um, it was named again many, many years ago by much earlier civilizations. Uh, Leo the lion is not visible tonight. It's a summertime and springtime constellation, uh, but of course it's a good example of one. Now, constellations are officially recognized. Uh, there's 88 officially recognized constellations. Uh, the uh, governing body, if you will, that recognizes the constellations is the International Astronomical, Astronomical Union, the IAU. Um, so they're officially recognized, but again, they're, they're, there's nothing scientific about it. You know, earlier people look up at the sky, saw the groups of stars in what is now the constellation Leo and thought, hey, that looks like a lion, let's call it Leo. That's pretty much how constellations are born. Um, for me, the importance of constellations is if you're familiar with the night sky and someone tells you, well, Venus is in Leo. If you know where to look for Leo, you can look up to the sky where Leo is and you can find Venus, for example. They're kind of like... Um, they're kind of like placeholders, I feel like almost, um, in, in the night sky. Uh, the whole night sky is sectioned off in the constellations. They're kind of like areas, really. Um, but again, nothing really scientific about them. So it will be important to remember that constellations are officially recognized because we also have what are called asterisms. So asterisms are simply a group of stars that form a recognizable pattern or shape. They're not officially recognized. An asterism is pretty much anything uh, that you'd like it to be. Uh, so for example, a very popular asterism is the Big Dipper. 
Uh, Big Dipper is over here uh, on the left side of the slide. Uh, the Big Dipper is not visible in that orientation tonight. That, that's how it looks like in the summertime. I'm sure you all are probably familiar with it. Uh, the old three stars um, in the handle, four in the ladle. Um, so the Big Dipper is an asterism. It's in the constellation Ursa Major, which you can see over on the right. Uh, so Ursa Major is the Big Bear. Um, and if you can kind of look closely in the picture there, you can see where the Big Dipper comes in. It kind of makes up like the hindquarters of the bear and then the tail. Now, when, you know, especially if you're in a more light polluted sky, you might just see the Big Dipper part. And so that's kind of where we named it, the Big Dipper, but really it's part of the, the Ursa Major constellation. Um, the difference here, Ursa Major is officially recognized. It's a constellation. Uh, the Big Dipper is not. It's just a part of it. Um, another common asterism, um, I will actually talk about it later, is the Winter Triangle. I'll show you a picture later on in the presentation. Um, the Summer Triangle is another asterism. And then in the constellation Sagittarius, there's an asterism called the Teapot, which is also another common one. So if you look up at the sky tonight and you think, hey, you know what, that kind of looks like a bucket. Um, that's an asterism. It's, again, unofficial. Um, it, it's kind of in our human nature when we look up at things or when we see things, we tend to find patterns and, and, and shapes and we organize things. It's kind of part of our very intelligent mind. Um, asterisms are kind of whatever whatever you make of them, really. So if you look up tonight and you think you see a shape, uh, that's that would be considered an asterism. Nothing, nothing official or scientific about them. So moving on from that, a little bit of technicalities there, but moving on from that, uh, we have planets, of course. Uh, there's a few planets you can see tonight, actually, uh, early in the evening. Uh, but planets are celestial bodies uh, moving in an elliptical orbit around a star. Um, there are eight planets in our solar system, um, Earth included. And then outside of our solar system, uh, there are planets as well. These are called exoplanets. Uh, these have been found for the last 20 plus years. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these exoplanets. Uh, and then an exoplanet, again, simply is a planet outside of our solar system, uh, which, of course, uh, they're of great interest to the scientific community. Uh, pictured in this slide uh, is Jupiter, as I'm sure a lot of you know, uh, the king of the planets, as it's sometimes called. Um, you can see its beautiful, colorful bands, and you can see the giant red spot, uh, which is off there to the um, center left of Jupiter in the picture. Um, so planets, of course, and then we have galaxies. Uh, galaxies are huge collections of gas, dust, and billions of stars and their solar systems. Uh, so solar systems just like ours with all of our eight planets, there's billions of those uh, just in the Milky Way. Um, so it might seem a lot of times like we're very special, very unique. Um, that's one of the beauties of astronomy. We get to see outside of our very comfortable uh, world and realize that we are one of uh, many, many solar systems, one of many, many planets, one of many star systems. Uh, galaxies, of course, are held together by gravity. Uh, there's um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of galaxies uh, that we found. And uh, pictured here is the Milky Way, which of course uh, is our home, uh, the Milky Way galaxy. It can be seen tonight, uh, not the best viewing, but it can be seen tonight. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, once we get over to that part of the presentation. Uh, we also have nebulas, um, or nebulae. Uh, so nebulas are giant clouds of uh, dust and gas in space. Uh, nebula are very interesting in that there are sometimes, they're both the, the beginning of a star and the end of a star. Um, it's, it's really very interesting. So um, some nebula, uh, like I mentioned, they are, uh, they're gas and dust that are thrown up by the explosion of a dying star. Uh, so once the star has reached the end of its life cycle, um, it will throw out gas and dust. We call that a nebula. But also, um, nebulas are also regions where new stars uh, are born. They're also known as stellar nurseries. Uh, they're kind of a birthplace for stars. Uh, pictured here in the slide is a beautiful photo of the Orion Nebula. Uh, the Orion Nebula is visible tonight. Of course, you wouldn't see like what's in the picture. Uh, that was taken by a very high power telescope uh, that is uh, much more capable than our human eyes from down here on Earth. Uh, the Orion Nebula, though, is visible tonight. We'll once again talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but that's the Orion Nebula. Uh, scientists do believe that our star, the sun, was born in a nursery similar to the Orion Nebula. So uh, again, with Nebula, they're both uh, nurseries, but also uh, uh, 
dying places. So it's really interesting the the huge uh, huge con huge opposites, if you will, there. So nebulas are very interesting. Um, seen through high powered cameras and telescopes are also very beautiful. You can see all the gorgeous colors there in the Orion Nebula. Um, we also have multiple star systems. Um, there is a multiple star, a binary star system that can be seen tonight. Um, so multiple star systems, as name would imply, they're systems of two or more stars uh, that are bound together by gravity. They orbit a common center of mass. Um, most solar systems that we found uh, are actually multiple star systems, two or more of uh, what we would call suns. Um, so we, our solar system is actually fairly unique in that we only have one star. Uh, we just have the sun. Uh, we're almost an exception, really. Most solar systems, again, that we have found are two or more of, again, what we would call suns. So um, uh, our life would be very, very different if we had a second sun. Uh, we probably wouldn't be here. Um, but there is a binary star system that can be seen tonight. Again, we'll talk about that in just a moment here. Uh, but there's multiple star systems uh, out there. There's star clusters. Uh, which can be uh, very, very beautiful when seen through a telescope. Um, so star clusters, uh, they're a group of uh, gravitationally bound stars. There's two types of star clusters. There's the globular star clusters, and then there's the open star clusters. So the globulars, uh, they're tight groups of hundreds of thousands of very old stars. So very, very dense, uh, very, very old stars. Some of the oldest stars we have found are found in globular star clusters. Um, and then, of course, I'll be opposite to open star clusters, uh, which are groups of less than a few hundred. Usually they're very, very young stars. Uh, and then pictured in the slide on the left, you can see the density there. Uh, with, all the time, with all the stars showing against the black over on the left, you have the Hercules. Uh, globular cluster, uh, not visible tonight. Um, excuse me, as I mentioned uh, a moment ago, some of the oldest stars we have found are in globular star clusters, including uh, that of the Hercules cluster. Over to the right, uh, the very pretty blues, uh, that is the Pleiades. Uh, the Pleiades uh, are visible tonight. Um, I'll try to I'll try my best to help you find it tonight, uh, to tell you what I'll look for. Uh, but the Pleiades are an example of an open star cluster. Um, that's over there on the right. And uh, of course, we have the stuff that we've put up in the uh, up in the sky, up in the universe. Uh, we have satellites uh, pictured here is the International Space Station, the ISS. Uh, satellites are artificial bodies placed in orbit around the Earth, Moon, or other uh, other objects, uh, and they are put. Uh, in orbit for a variety of reasons, uh, maybe to collect information, uh, very commonly for communication. Um, satellites can be seen uh, all the time. I would imagine if you kind of stood at your doorstep tonight for maybe just five minutes and you look closely, you would probably see little satellites moving about. Uh, for satellites, uh, you kind of just want to want to look at a part of the sky, ideally fix yourself on a part of the sky, and then you'll probably see what seem to be tiny dots moving at a steady pace. So the key with the satellites is they move steadily, uh, sometimes fast, sometimes slow. Uh, if you do see something moving uh, at, an, at a steady pace, that's more than likely a satellite. And there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them in orbit. So there's lots and lots. Uh, the ISS is a, co is a popular one people like to look for. The Hubble Space Telescope is another. Um, but uh, yeah, I think if you if you just uh, stood outside for just a few minutes and watched, I'm sure you'd find, uh, or you'd see some satellites, I should say. Um, satellites, of course, when you see that little light moving at a steady pace, um, satellites are just reflecting um, the light from the sun. They, of course, don't emit their own light. Um, neither do the planets. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but yeah, here's the ISS and then a little bit on satellites. And again, that's the stuff that we've put out there um, in our universe. So what you can see tonight, uh, what can you see tonight? So of all these things that we've just talked about, these definitions I've thrown at you, uh, what are the stuff can you all see tonight if you were to stand outside your home uh, in the Naples area, really anywhere, uh, what would you be able to see? Tonight, uh, you can actually see three different planets. You'd have to go out early in the evening, though. Don't wait too late. Uh, but you can look for Mercury, Jupiter, and Saturn. Uh, you can also uh, see a galaxy or maybe even a few galaxies if you have good eyesight. Uh, you can spot a nebula, star clusters, binary star systems, uh, tens of constellations, countless asterisms, like we talked about. Asterism is whatever, whatever you 
Whatever you make of it, if you look up and you see a shape, that's an asterism. You don't have to ask anyone. Uh, and then, uh, of course, Earth's moon is visible as well uh, tonight. Um, some of these uh, would require at least binoculars, some maybe a small telescope. A lot, though, can be seen with your naked eye. Uh, no, no equipment required. So let's talk a little bit about some of these. So first off um, is Mercury. Uh, Mercury will set tonight at 7.22 p.m. So again, you want to make sure that you go out fairly early, uh, shortly after sunset, once it gets dark in your area. Uh, sunset's a little bit before 6 tonight. Uh, so Mercury will be up for almost an hour and a half um, after sunset. Looking at the picture there, um, if I hadn't told you it was Mercury, wouldn't you think it's Earth's moon? Um, Mercury and our, and our moon look very, very similar. Uh, in fact, they're almost of the same size. Mercury is, is uh, the smallest planet in our solar system, uh, commonly known fact, of course. It's only slightly larger than our moon. Um, like our moon, it has a heavily cratered surface. You can see there in the picture, uh, very, very cratered, uh, much like our moon is. Uh, Mercury, because it is the closest, well, Mercury is the closest planet to the sun. And because it's the closest planet to the sun, it also moves about the sun the fastest. It has less distance to cover. Um, so it moves about the sun relatively very quickly, especially when compared to other planets. Um, a, a year on Mercury is only 86 Earth days. Uh, so our three months is a year on Mercury. Mercury will make an entire revolution around the sun um, in what it takes in, in, in our three months. So that's, that's pretty impressive. Um, Gosh, would that be four times faster uh, than the Earth? So that's that's pretty impressive there. Um, Mercury has no rings. It has no moons. And because of its proximity to the sun and the uh, intense solar radiation which, with which it is blasted by uh, every single day, it's very unlikely uh, that life as we know it is um, is on Mercury. So um, not really a good good place to look for, for life as we know it. Um, Again, because of its proximity to the sun, um, if we were to stand on Mercury, uh, the sun would look, for one, it would look about three times larger than it looks like from Earth. So three times larger. And uh, the, the solar radiation, or excuse me, the brightness from the sun would be seven times brighter. So imagine, imagine that, seven times brighter. Uh, I'll walk out sometimes and just having the sunlight reflecting off the water here will hurt my eyes. cannot imagine on Mercury. So not a good place to look for life, but obviously uh, a very interesting body. Uh, first, first planet from the sun. Uh, and again, visible tonight, uh, probably low on the horizon, more than likely. Uh, visible until 722, well, setting at 722. So I would go out maybe about 630 to 7, uh, look for a, uh, a bright dot near the horizon by where the sun has set. Uh, you also have Jupiter. Uh, Jupiter will give you a little bit more time. So Jupiter won't set tonight until almost 9 o'clock. Uh, Jupiter is the uh, largest planet um, in our solar system. It's the first of what we call the gas giants. Uh, so Mercury, like us, like Venus, like Mars, are terrestrial planets or rocky planets. Uh, we could actually stand on the surface of Mercury, Venus, Mars. Uh, Jupiter and the other uh, planets that follow are gas giants. There's no surface. There's no rocky surface for us to stand on. So um, if we could go to Jupiter, uh, again, there would be no surface. It's gaseous. Um, if you had uh, just a nice pair of binoculars, uh, they would go ahead and if you if you aimed at Jupiter uh, with binoculars, you could see four of its largest moons, uh, what they call the Galilean moons. Uh, the Galilean moons, as uh, you can probably infer, were named after Galileo Galilei, uh, the first one, the first person to observe um, these moons with the telescope. Uh, the four Galilean moons are known as, are called Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Um, so uh, again, a pair of binoculars would show you the moons. If you don't have binoculars, though, quite all right, you can still see Jupiter. Uh, again, it won't set until almost nine o'clock. You have plenty of time, uh, after, you know, early in the evening. And what you're looking for Jupiter is you're probably going to be drawn to Jupiter. It's going to be very, very bright, relatively large, um, and I think it'll be by the moon, uh, by where the moon is. So you can look out for Jupiter. Um, it's very, very pretty, I think, I think to see. And again, it is our largest planet, the first of what they call uh, the gas giants. Uh, speaking of moons, uh, Jupiter actually has the most moons uh, of any planet in our solar system. Not really surprising with its tremendous size. Um, I believe there are now uh, over 80 moons uh, that NASA has uh, and other agencies have found um, 
orbiting Jupiter. So over 80 moons for Jupiter. Uh, the four largest, though, again, are the Galilean moons, which are named here on the slide. And you could also see Saturn, uh, beautiful Saturn. Uh, this one's also setting a little early. You want to go out to try and see it. Saturn will set at 7.37 p.m. tonight. If you had a small telescope, maybe six inch or so, um, you can see its beautiful icy rings, which of course uh, make Saturn famous. Um, it's uh, rings made of ice and dust. Uh, Saturn is the second largest planet um, in our solar system, just like Jupiter. It's a gas giant. It actually follows Jupiter in its uh, order from the sun. Uh, second largest planet in our solar system. Saturn's pretty special. Seeing Saturn with the naked eye is pretty special because this is the farthest planet uh, that humans can see with the naked eye. We cannot perceive Neptune or Uranus. Uh, they are too far away. You would need a telescope. So um, if you look at, if you can find Saturn tonight, um, you are looking uh, at as far away as we can see in our solar system, which is pretty special. Um, and let's see, a year on Saturn. So in sharp contrast to Mercury, uh, a year on Mercury is only 86 Earth days. A year on Saturn is roughly, um, what is it? Oh, 20, 24, no, 24 years, I think. Um, yeah, 24 Earth years is one year on Saturn, I believe, if I have that right. So sharp contrast to, to Mercury. Obviously, with its greater distance from the, from the sun, it has, of course, a farther orbit to cover to make its way around. So um, time would be a little slower, at least by, by our standards, on Saturn. Um, for Saturn, um, look look for it in the same area where you would look for Jupiter. Um, so I, I do I do feel that you're you're going to look towards the southwest for all the planets. Um, you'll probably be drawn to Jupiter. It's going to be very bright, um, relatively large looking. Um, and then if you can find Jupiter, uh, go down towards the horizon in a line, and you'll find Saturn. And then you also find Mercury in that same area as well. And they'll be relatively bright, uh, even with the dusk. So try to see if you can find them tonight. Um, even if you don't have a telescope or binoculars, I think it's pretty special to see the other planets in our solar system. Um, moving on from the planets, uh, there is uh, a galaxy you can see tonight. Um, there's actually at least two um, you can see with the naked eye. So uh, for one, you can see uh, our home. You can see the Milky Way galaxy. This picture, by the way, was actually taken uh, next door to me at the Big Cypress National Preserve, uh, which is, you know, about an hour from Naples. We'll talk a little bit more about the Big Cypress uh, later on in the presentation. Uh, but this picture here is of the Milky Way in the summertime uh, over at the Big Cypress National Preserve, which actually protects some of the darkest night skies uh, in the East Coast. So pretty special spot we have right here in Southwest Florida. Um, the Milky Way is best seen in the summertime. Uh, it's more visible. The center of it is kind of is, is visible from us uh, to us here on Earth. So the winter is not the ideal time, but it still can be seen. Uh, it will be it will be pretty faint and only be visible uh, very early in the evening. So if you go out looking for it, uh, go out looking for it early uh, in the evening, shortly after, well, not shortly after sunset, you wanna give it some time to get dark, of course. Um, but you can go out looking for it and you're gonna wanna look kind of directly overhead and then uh, towards the north. Um, it'll appear as a very light, cloudy band that goes that arcs across the sky. It'll be cloudy though, so adjust your expectations, it's gonna be faint, um, but you can try to look for it tonight as well. The Milky Way, um, if you had very, very good eyesight uh, and you knew where to look, uh, there is another galaxy that can be seen. Uh, that's the Andromeda Galaxy. Uh, with the Andromeda Galaxy, you'd be looking almost directly overhead. Um, it, it is quite difficult to see. I, I'm not able to resolve it too well myself. Um, my eyesight's not the best, but um, the Andromeda Galaxy, if you can see it, uh, you might need a help of uh, maybe a, an app on your phone or perhaps a star chart if you had one. But if you could see the Andromeda Galaxy, uh, that is as far away as a human eye can see, um, the Andromeda Galaxy. So that's also very special uh, to be able to see a a galaxy outside of our own with, with our own eyes without equipment. Um, so to move on from galaxies, uh, there's nebula. 
Uh, so again, that's the Orion Nebula there uh, in the slide that we showed earlier. Uh, the Orion Nebula is also known as M42. The M stands for Messier after astronomer Charles Messier uh, that cataloged several objects that he saw many years ago. Um, so the Orion Nebula is in the constellation Orion, uh, which we'll talk about momentarily. It's a very popular wintertime constellation. Um, it is visible with the naked eye, uh, only 1,500 light years away. Uh, one light year is 2.88 trillion miles. Uh, 2.88 trillion miles is one light year. So if we have any mathematicians, uh, multiply 1,500 by 2.88 trillion. <laughs> um, pretty small distance, uh, wild that we can resolve that with our eyes. Um, interestingly enough, you know, these uh, these objects we've talked about, not only do they have a lot of scientific importance, they also have a lot of human importance. Uh, people have always been looking at the night sky. Uh, the night sky has always been there. Uh, so earlier people certainly uh, here on earth would look up to the sky. They would see things um, like we still do today. They would come up with uh, stories, uh, pictures, make shapes. Um, in Mayan culture, uh, very interestingly, the Orion Nebula is actually believed to be the cosmic fire of creation. So it was very important to the Mayan civilization. Um, and again, like I mentioned earlier, um, scientists do believe that our sun uh, was born in a, a nebula similar to the Orion Nebula. Um, and when I when I show you the picture of the constellation Orion, which I think might be the next slide, I'll show you where in Orion to look uh, for for the nebula. And again, uh, with adjusting expectations, uh, don't look for all the pretty colors there. Of course, um, our eyes cannot resolve that from from Earth. This was taken by a telescope. I do believe the Hubble a few years ago. Um, so uh, open star clusters. Uh, there is one, uh, at least one that's visible tonight. It's the Pleiades uh, that we mentioned earlier. Uh, the Pleiades are the ones pictured here on the slide. Uh, Pleiades are also known as M45, again, Messier 45. Um, it is in the constellation Taurus. Um, you can see the Pleiades even with the naked eye to see something, um, to actually see like the the stars kind of group like that, like you see in the picture, you want to have at least binoculars, not a small telescope. Um, but you can see the Pleiades with the naked eye. What it looks like, and maybe some of you have seen it, um, if, if it's dark enough by where you're by, your eyes will be drawn to it because it kind of makes a shape. It looks like a tennis racket to me. Um, it will be a, kind of a, a small, almost circular looking object with maybe a little bit of a handle. So again, it looks like a tennis racket to me. It's small. Um, this time of the year, tonight, it'll be directly overhead. So if you look up tonight, you look straight up, um, look for a tiny little object. It might look like a tennis racket, maybe a lollipop, uh, and that'll be the Pleiades. And again, if you had binoculars or telescope, a small one even, uh, you can point at that and maybe make out some of the tiny stars. Um, but the Pleiades is visible, um, visible throughout the winter. So if you can't go out tonight, uh, you can go out for the next few weeks and the Pleiades will still be up there. Uh, the constellation Taurus won't set until uh, later in the spring. Um, so that's a star cluster we can look out for. Uh, binary star systems. This one, you'll need a small telescope. Um, it will be too difficult to, to, to actually see the two stars like that. Um, but pictured here is Alberio. You can see two very different stars. You can see that yellow one and then a blue one. So like we mentioned earlier, most solar systems uh, will have at least two stars. Again, we are pretty special. We're un well, not unique, but we're a, pretty much an exception in the way that we just have the one star that we go around. We just have one sun. Um, most systems will have at least two. Uh, Alberio uh, is, is one of those uh, multiple star systems. It's in a constellation Cygnus, uh, which is the swan. Uh, and that will be setting uh, pretty early tonight as well. Uh, if you do see the Milky Way, you can look for Cygnus. And then Alberio uh, is actually the head of the swan. And with the telescope, you'd be able to see that that one star that we're seeing is actually two different ones. So that's visible tonight. Uh, but that's going to be really early in the evening, low in the horizon, and you wouldn't get a telescope. So um, unless you have one, I probably wouldn't go looking for that one. There's a lot of other stuff to check out, though. Um, then here's Orion, we've mentioned a few times. So um, there's lots of constellations that can be seen tonight. Uh, we talked about Taurus. You can see the Taurus constellation. Um, you can also see Orion, um, which um, I think might be the most popular wintertime constellation. 
Um, if you're from places up north, when you see the three stars of Orion's belt, you probably know it's getting to be cold time, probably time to come 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 down where somewhere somewhere sunny. Um, it's it's a it's a telltale sign of winter. It's, it comes up in the fall time and it's up. Orion is up throughout the winter. Uh, it won't set until later in the spring. Um, Orion is named for a mighty hunter in Greek mythology. Orion the hunter is the name of the constellation. Uh, the brightest stars uh, in Orion. Let me see, I can't show you. Oh, can you all see the my mouse pointer? All right. The, the brightest stars uh, in Orion uh, are uh, Rigel. Um, so let me let me break this down here a little bit. So what the earlier people saw when they named this Orion is they, they saw a man, they saw a hunter. So over here is, and this will change depending on how people see it, but most people agree this is a bow. Some people think it could be he's holding up a shield or maybe even holding up a dead animal. It's, of course, up to the imagination, kind of what, what you all see. Um, I myself uh, see a shield. So he's holding up something here, maybe a bow, maybe a shield. We'll never know. Um, this is his belt. These three stars make up his belt. This is his lower body. That's his left foot, his right foot. This is his upper body, his torso. You have his left shoulder, his right shoulder, and then this would be uh, the head area over here. Some depictions will actually show Orion as um, holding up a sword outstretched, kind of like this. Um, and so some people will, instead of, you know, will think this is that sword up there. Uh, but anyway, this is uh, what earlier people saw, Orion the hunter. Now, uh, the brightest stars are going to be Rigel. Rigel's going to be down here. It's his. It's his um, left. Yeah, yeah, left foot uh, is Rigel. Oh, I lost my. Yeah. Rigel is there, and then Beetlejuice uh, is up here. Beetlejuice is his left shoulder. It's uh, reddish in color. Um, tonight, if you look up, uh, you want to look over to the southeast. You'll probably see the belt. Uh, the belt is made up of very bright stars. Um, it's three three stars in a row. From the belt, um, if you can see a reddish star in the vicinity, you're probably looking at Betelgeuse, uh, which is a, a super giant, um, the star Betelgeuse. And then from the belt, if you kind of look down, if you will, and see kind of a bright bluish star, um, you'd probably be seeing Rigel, which is his left foot. So you can look out for the constellation Orion. Um, again, I live in East Naples off a of rattlesnake hammock, and I can see Orion pretty well. I can make out these bright stars. I can probably make them out even from where I live, uh, even with the little light pollution around me. Um, I mentioned earlier about the Orion Nebula. So the nebula is in this constellation. Uh, to try and look for the nebula, you'd want to find the belt and then go towards his lower body. Um, some people like, to, it's not shown in this picture, uh, but below his belt, there's a, a, a sheath, a sheath of his sword, and that's where the nebula would be, the Orion Nebula. So if you can find the belt and you can see something that kind of looks like it's hanging from his belt, that's the sheath, and that's where um, the Orion Nebula would be. Um, so that's one, one of several constellations you can see tonight. Um, pretty easy to see, and it's up all winter. So if you can't go out tonight, you can look for it in February, March, later on in January. It'll be up there until about, about mid-late April. Um, asterisms. So we mentioned earlier, asterisms are, are always found because they're just uh, what comes from your imagination. Uh, a popular and common one, though, uh, is the winter triangle. Uh, so with the winter triangle, here in this picture, you can see uh, here's Orion that we just talked about. See, there's Rigel, there's Betelgeuse. Um, the winter triangle is anchored by Betelgeuse in Orion, Procyon, in Canis Minor, the little dog, and then Cirrus in Canis Major, the big dog. So one, two, and three. These three bright stars make up what's called the Winter Triangle. It will be visible tonight. You might have to wait just a little bit, maybe 8.30 or so for Cirrus and Procyon to come up. But you can, uh, uh, if you can find a run in Beetlejuice, try to see if you can find these other two. Cirrus will be unmistakably bright. Cirrus is the brightest star in the night sky. Um, so you'll be able to see it if you just give yourself enough time. Um, again, you want to wait until maybe 8.30 or so. Um, but Cirrus will be very, very bright. And then you can try to see if you can connect, make, make the winter triangle, connect Cirrus to Beetlejuice and then over to Procyon. 
Um, and like we mentioned earlier with the asterisms, um, they're not constellations. The true constellations are the big dog, Canis Major, the little dog, Canis Minor, and then Orion the Hunter. Um, Greek mythology says that Canis Major and Canis Minor, the big and little dog, are Orion's hunting dogs. So they're together in the night sky. Um, you can always find them together. Um, so that's an asterism to look out for tonight. And of course, uh, something else that we can easily see, right? No, no guidance, no help needed. You can look for the moon. Uh, the moon is very often overlooked. I think it's funny. I feel that many astronomers do not like the moon. They feel like it gets in the way. Um, uh, you know, obviously it illuminates our night sky, makes other objects difficult to see. Uh, I think that the moon, however, is very, very beautiful. Um, if you remember that picture of Mercury, you can see the, uh, the striking similarities, uh, that kind of darker color, heavily cratered surface. Uh, the moon will not look like that tonight, however. That's at full illumination, of course. Uh, the moon tonight is a little under 60% illuminated. Uh, full moon is next Wednesday, I believe. So it's currently waxing. Uh, more and more of its face is being illuminated as it goes about its, uh, its orbit. Uh, the moon will rise at 1.20 in the afternoon. So just a few hours here. Um, you can look for it in the, in the daytime sky. Uh, it won't set until early this morning. So it'll be up all night. Uh, well, for, for most of us, it go to sleep early. Um, Average distance from the Earth is 238,000 miles, so um, really not too far away. When we talked earlier about something being 1,500 uh, light years away, uh, the Earth, the Moon, of course, is relatively very, 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 very close to us. It's the largest natural sa satellite relative to planet it orbits, uh, which I think is pretty special. Um, we, of course, the Earth only has one Moon. We only have one satellite. Jupiter has 80 plus, Saturn has 60 plus. We just have the one, um, but uh, we do have um, the largest moon relative to, to, to planet, which is pretty neat. Uh, the moon is about a quarter of the Earth's size. Um, and of course, in my opinion, what makes the moon uh, very, very special is that it's the only celestial body outside of the Earth, which we stand on now, uh, that humans have stepped foot on. Uh, we have not done that yet uh, anywhere else. There's been a dozen people uh, ever uh, to have walked on the moon. Only a dozen humans uh, in all of human history have walked the moon. Uh, the first, of course, would be Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin uh, that first landed in July of 1969. So um, obviously a very special time for, for humanity. Um, but moving on from, you know, what we can see tonight to why should I look up at the sky? Why should I do it? Uh, well, there's there's lots of reasons. Uh, hopefully you folks maybe have your own reasons for why you think it's worthwhile to look up at the sky. Uh, but of course, a couple reasons. It's uh, it's free and anyone can do it, right? You can easily do it. All it requires is you stepping outside of your home. Um, you can do it on your own or with company, uh, with your friends, your family. Um, Certainly uh, a, a night, a starry sky can be a very, very beautiful sight and inspiring sight for many, many people. Uh, if we think about all the uh, art that has been created and has been inspired by the night sky, uh, all the songs, uh, the movies, uh, the books, uh, uh, all, all the paintings, uh, poetry, right? On and on and on. People have always been inspired by the night sky. Certainly not something just today, but for always, uh, we have been inspired by the night sky. It certainly is very beautiful. Uh, they can relieve stress and make you feel closer to nature, certainly, um, provide you with uh, uh, an interesting perspective, as it says there at the bottom. It can be inspiring. And then uh, the perspective part is my personal favorite. Um, looking up at the night sky, uh, we can kind of be better connected to not just uh, all the other people on our planet, but all the people on our planet who came before us, right? Because it's always been the same night sky, uh, has always been there. So there is a, is a constant and there's a timelessness to it uh, that I think we kind of struggle finding with things on the surface, things things on our planet. Um, the, the night sky certainly uh, timeless, reminds us of, hopefully helps us remind us of our place here uh, on our planet and in the universe. Um, now, there is, uh, outside of the reasons why we should do it and the benefits it can provide to us, um, night skies uh, are important uh, for some practical reasons. Uh, dark night skies um, are important for wildlife, of course. Um, here in South Florida, we have uh, quite a few nocturnal animals or crepuscular animals. Uh, so pictured here, uh, we have the Florida panther over on the left. Uh, on the right, we have a sea turtle. Um, 
there's actually more species on our planet that are nocturnal than are diurnal, which is a, a daytime animal. Um, and so dark night skies are important for these animals because it kind of, well, for, for the Florida panther, for example, uh, it will help them uh, find cover. It will help them better hunt prey um, and uh, yeah, hide themselves from prey. So it'll be important for, for panthers, other wildlife. Uh, sea turtles, I almost consider them to be kind of the poster child uh, when we think about light pollution and the negative effects of light pollution, uh, especially as it relates to wildlife. A lot of people will think about sea turtles. Uh, we have five species of sea turtles here in Everglades National Park. Uh, they're all listed, unfortunately, as either endangered or threatened with extinction. Uh, one of their uh, main threats is light pollution. Uh, in Naples, I'm sure you all know, you've seen the signs when you go to the beach over the summertime. Uh, you'll see the lighting ordinances that are in place. Um, you'll see the red lights. You'll see the shielded lights that are pointing down at the parking lot. Um, so li light pollution is certainly uh, a, a big issue. It's one that the National Park Service is tackling system-wide, uh, something we're hoping to tackle here at Everglades National Park. Uh, much like our water can be dirty or polluted, much like the air can be polluted, uh, so can our night sky as we let out more and more artificial lighting. So um, there's certainly practical benefits for dark night skies um, outside of the inspiration we get and, and the scientific information we get. Uh, there's certainly uh, benefits for wildlife. Um, I, I like to think that uh, all animals need uh, the nighttime, just like they need, uh, you know, a forest or a desert or an ocean to live in, uh, in the same way they, they need a dark night sky. It's kind of, uh, it's in our biology. All, all life on earth has evolved with a uh, routine and regular cycle of day, night, day, night, and it's only been uh, maybe 150 years or so that humans have started changing that with letting out artificial light into, into our night sky and kind of endangering the night, if you will. So um, dark night sky is certainly very important for our wildlife. And uh, another benefit uh, of dark night skies actually relates back to us a little bit more practical than what we spoke about earlier. Um, research does suggest that um, dark night skies uh, can improve human health. There's been a lot of studies done, uh, a lot of research conducted uh, that suggests that artificial light at night uh, can actually negatively affect uh, our health. It can put us at greater risk for diabetes, sleep disorders, obesity, uh, breast cancer, depression, et cetera. So um, I think that's very interesting. Uh, we too uh, are also uh, uh, natural uh, here on earth. We also evolved with uh, day, night, day, night, day, night. And uh, as, that's, as the nighttime is being interrupted, um, I'm not very surprised that we have found some negative effects on our human health, uh, which is certainly very interesting. There's some great studies out there. Um, so Moving on from that, right, uh, light pollution is an issue. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, the National Park Service is committed to tackling light pollution and uh, trying, to do, uh, trying to do its part in letting out less artificial light at night. So what's Everglades doing? Uh, well, for one, uh, we do quite a bit of outreach and uh, interpretive astronomy programs. We do them both uh, virtually, like I'm doing right now. We also do them on site. Um, we actually have interpretive astronomy programs um, throughout all of Everglades National Park. So there's four main visitor areas here in the park. Uh, there's Gulf Coast where I'm at in Everglades City, about an hour from Naples. Um, there's Shark Valley, about an hour and a half from Naples over in Miami. And then there's the Homestead area and the Flamingo area, which will be a couple hour drive uh, from Naples. Uh, but each, each district, each area uh, will have uh, its own um, schedule of astronomy programs, everything from stargazing on the grounds to uh, paddles at night, nighttime boat tours, uh, even nighttime bike rides. So the nighttime bike rides would take place at Shark Valley, again, about an hour and a half from Naples. Um, I believe they like to do the bike rides at new moon and full moon. Uh, so those are pretty neat if you're up for a 15 mile bike ride uh, in the Everglades at night uh, and you can get to see the dark side of the Everglades, if you will. Those are a lot of fun. A little closer to you all, though, where I'm at, uh, we do have nighttime paddles. Uh, we do those uh, about three Saturdays uh, a month. 
two hour long programs. You can rent a canoe or a kayak and bring your own. Uh, we paddle out here into Chukalusky Bay and we talk a little bit about um, just the general area. We'll talk about the night sky, celestial navigation, et cetera. Uh, and then uh, we're very excited uh, that we're now offering uh, night sky boat tours. Uh, that's new this season. They've been very, very popular. Um, we're only offering four and I think, I think all four are either sold out or almost sold out but we do the nighttime boat tours um, one Saturday a month, uh, the Saturday that's nearest the new moon to have the darkest possible sky. Um, so the nighttime boat tour is two hours long. Uh, we partner with our concession who's here on site and we go out on a 45 foot catamaran boat out into the Gulf of Mexico and we stargaze from the boat. Uh, the next uh, nighttime boat tour is January 29th and I believe uh, the following one would be February 26, if that's the last Saturday in February. So um, this is our first season trying to, trying, trying to boat tours out, the nighttime boat tours out. They've gone really well. We're very excited. And of course, the idea behind doing outreach and astronomy programs here on site is to raise awareness, um, uh, help folks uh, learn more about astronomy, help them stargaze, uh, and raise the awareness about light pollution and, and other concerns um, uh, about uh, astronomy and, and the night sky. Again, the night sky is a very important resource. Uh, we're committed to, to helping the public learn more about it and experience it on their own terms. Um, there is a, an agency that the National Park Service uh, partners with. It's the International Dark Sky Association. Uh, it was founded in the 1980s. It's headquartered in Tucson. Um, it's a, a worldwide organization whose mission is to preserve and protect the nighttime environment and our heritage of dark skies uh, through responsible outdoor lighting. So responsible outdoor lighting would include red lights, would include shields around your lights, and would include lights pointing straight down. Uh, basically what you don't want is an uncovered light bulb uh, that's just throwing light out into the sky. That's where you get the light pollution. Uh, it's not just artificial lights at night, it's unshielded lights at night is really what it is. Um, there are 39, there's almost 40 National Park Service sites around the entire country uh, that are protected as dark sky parks as of January 2022. Uh, there's three of those dark sky parks here in Florida, or dark sky sites, I should say, here in Florida. One of them is the Big Cypress National Preserve, uh, right next door to us, only an hour from Naples. Um, it is a uh, international dark sky park right here in Florida. So again, the Big Cypress right next door to us protects some of the the darkest remaining night skies in the East Coast. It's, it's pretty fantastic. Um, uh, Everglades National Park um, hopes to uh, apply as a dark sky park. So there's a pretty rigorous application process. Um, uh, a, a site that's interested in becoming a dark sky park has to put in an application to the association. Um, it takes most parks several years to come into full compliance. Basically what the site has to do is commit to providing the public with uh, an accessible area to stargaze and experience the night sky. The site also has to um, do some kind of programming, whether it's outreach like this or programs on site, telescope programs, et cetera. Uh, but the site has to commit to teaching the public about the night sky. And then finally, the site also has to um, commit to having responsible outdoor lighting. So removing lights that are not needed, um, uh, shielding lights, uh, redirecting them so that they point down, or maybe just using different kinds of bulbs entirely, maybe motion censored as opposed to on, on, night or uh, things like that. So the, the site has to commit to responsible outdoor lighting. Uh, the Everglades does hope to uh, at some point in the future become an international dark sky park. Uh, we certainly have the programming part down. Uh, we have the, the dark night skies. Uh, it's just a matter now of retrofitting our lights so that they're more responsible and um, better protecting our night sky. Um, Following here are just a few of those 39 national, I'm coming up on my time here. Uh, so um, in these next few slides, I'll just show you a few of the National Park Service sites uh, uh, around the entire United States that are dark sky parks. So uh, again, right here in Southwest Florida, we have the Big Cypress National Preserve. Another uh, international dark sky park is Petrified Forest over in Arizona. If you ever find yourself over there, you can see how beautiful the Milky Way looks over their visitor center. Uh, the Great Basin National Park has some of the darkest night skies I've ever seen. This is over in Nevada, um, several hours from the nearest interstate, so not surprisingly, they're a dark sky park. 
uh, Chaco Culture National Historical Park uh, in my old home of uh, New Mexico uh, is another international dark sky park. Very beautiful as well. Uh, Black Canyon of the Gunnison in Western Colorado. Uh, the Grand Canyon, of course, a very popular Grand Canyon National Park in Arizona uh, is an international dark sky park. And uh, just a little bit here, kind of in closing, uh, to talk back about perspective. Uh, one of my very favorite things about stargazing and about astronomy in general. Um, I like this little comic strip quite a bit. Uh, the boy is telling the tiger, if people sat outside and looked at the stars each night, I'll bet they'd live a lot differently. Um, again, uh, my favorite thing about stargazing, about astronomy, is that um, when we look up, we kind of look into the past, uh, for one. The light that we see coming from the stars, left the stars, probably many, many years ago. That's, what, um, uh, that's what's meant by the term light year. Um, so, you know, for example, the Orion Nebula is 1,500 light years away. The light that we see tonight from the Orion Nebula left the nebula 1,500 years ago, um, which, you know, is almost impossible really for us to kind of really wrap our mind around. It's such a big distance, uh, a big time. but when we look up, we, we look up at the night sky, we look up into the past, and uh, I think it's a very humbling experience. Um, and I certainly agree with, uh, with the boy there in the comic. I think we'd, we'd live a lot differently if we, if we looked up a little bit more. And I did want to um, leave you with something else, um, a picture of uh, our wonderful planet, of planet Earth. Um, interestingly enough, uh, the Earth would be uh, the last planet that humans would see uh, in its entirety, uh, because of course we we stand on its surface, we live on its surface. Uh, we wouldn't see uh, the Earth until um, uh, you know 1960s, 1950s or so, uh, when we started uh, making trips out uh, to outer space and the Moon. Uh, this picture here uh, is called the Blue Marble. It was taken in the early 1970s by one of the Apollo missions. Uh, one of the first pictures ever taken uh, of our planet, and um, Another thing that I feel makes astronomy special is um, I think the more we learn about uh, outer space, the more we learn about other planets, exoplanets, etc. cetera, uh, I think the more special um, our planet becomes uh, because uh, we have been looking for uh, life as we know it uh, and other bodies for, uh, you know, as long as I'm sure humans have been around, we haven't found it. Um, so I think that the more we learn outside of our own planet, the more our planet, I think, uh, the more special our planet becomes. So uh, the more unique we, 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 we learn it is. Um, and I'll leave you with a final quote here uh, by an astronaut who actually uh, had a chance to see, one of the few people who has had a chance to see uh, the Earth uh, from space, because the rest of us are stuck on here. Um, so Jim Lowell said uh, the following from his experience uh, seeing Earth from lunar or orbit. Uh, he said, that was really a significant sight for me because I could put my thumb to the window of the spacecraft and completely hide the Earth. I realized that everything I had ever known, my home, my loved ones, everything that was there that I had known about is behind my thumb. I realized at that time just how insignificant we are in the universe. So again, that's Jim Lovell, uh, and that's uh, kind of a recollection of his from uh, seeing the Earth from lunar orbit. So um, uh, yeah, I cannot imagine what an experience it must be like to see uh, your home, uh, right? Uh, like, like Jim said, everything he's ever known is, is on this planet, on this floating rock here in outer space. Everything he's ever known is there, and he can cover it all up with just his thumb. Um, so yeah, kind of, I think, uh, just kind of downscales everything, you know, all of a sudden I feel like maybe all of our day-to-day -day problems and stresses and issues maybe aren't quite as great as they might seem, you know, uh, so just something to think about uh, as always, an interesting perspective, one of my favorite parts uh, about astronomy and, and nature in general, really, it's just that perspective that we gain, um, but that was uh, my closing statement. I apologize. I'm a few minutes over. Um, I'm going to leave you here with my contact information. Um, if you have any questions on the presentation, any questions on Everglades National Park, uh, what programs you're up to, anything like that, feel free to send me an email. You can also give me a call if you like. I'm on the field quite a bit, so email might, might work best, um, but you're welcome to give me a call as well. And uh, thank all of you in the audience for all of your uh, attention today. I sure hope you're able to get out tonight or tomorrow night uh, and look up and uh, hopefully see some of the objects we talked about. Um, if you're interested, if, 
if you like the technology, if you have a smartphone, there's quite a bit of free apps you can download. Um, and you can, um, you, you can use that to help you find your way in the night sky as well. Don't feel like you're cheating. I sometimes do it myself to make sure I have the right stars and whatnot. Um, but thank you all very much for your attention. Uh, Lou, Andy, Becky, everyone at the Naples Preserve, thank you all very much again for having the National Park Service uh, and myself specifically uh, on your Nature Talk series. I always have fun doing these. So thanks so much.